and good evening and welcome to the Touring Fan Live. And tonight, I am so honored to be having with me very world, world-renowned, world um, very well-known in his... If you've probably seen his photography, you've probably heard the name. Well, now you get to see the face. And tonight, I'm so excited to have with me Charles Peterson. Charles, how are you doing tonight? Good. Yeah, world-renowned and sitting here in my basement. <laughs> Well, well, you know, we all can't have, we can't all showcase the fancy things. We go to, we go, to, we, we hide in our yeah, basement. I, I, I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Charles, you know, um, I had told you this right before the interview. This was something I've been trying to find a way to rope you into, like have a reason for the last couple of years of like pull you in because I just don't want to be like, hey, just come on the show. And a couple of weeks ago, it was posted that you know you'd be having this exhibit um, at uh, Easy Street uh, Records up in Seattle, and. Um, I was like, I have I had to ask. And I'm so glad that you said yes to this because, you know, growing up and um, and looking in magazines and seeing a lot of your work on paper and then not knowing who you were until I was in college and learning about photography and then kind of putting two together, um, it, it really is an absolute honor to speak to you. Yeah, thank you. So let's start with an easy question. I think this is a nice, easy one for you. What made you fall in love with photography to establish this to want to be a career? That's a good question. I mean, I, I started pretty early on. I had an uncle uh, who's not that much older than me, really. And he, had a, he was in the Boy Scouts and did photography and my grandmother's, in my grandmother's laundry closet. And I just remember just the magic of prints coming up in the developer and uh, he, he also played the local radio station, so, you know, there was Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and, and classic rock when it was not that classic at that point. Um, so, I don't know, somehow they set the seed there, and, and I, I just, I've never known anything but photography since. I did it on the junior high and high school newspaper and yearbook, and then, uh, you know, my first job was dipping and dunking film. E6 film and a little lab mm. and you know I've done all trade work like that but then of course uh, you know as soon as I got to college my friends were in these bands and it was just sort of a natural fit you know talking about dark rooms and developing like you ever, like it just brings back that smell there was such a distinctive smell of like you know mixing the well first of all you either mix the chemicals right or everything was completely destroyed um, but like there is there's there's a natural like I don't know like art form to like like right now I enjoy dropping photos into Photoshop or Lightroom and just and one two three you can you can roll through photos pretty quickly especially if you know what you're doing it goes pretty quickly for me um, but like there was just such like there was such an art and fine tuning to a darkroom and going in and like having to have all these tools and how to quit, you know, how long you had to let a photo sit and how many baths I had to go through and what paper to use. And well, yeah, it, it, the paper uh, darkroom paper doesn't have a much of a dynamic range. Mm -hmm. So particularly the, the pictures like I was taking with heavy flash and whatnot, you had to dodge and burn so you know you had to burn in the light areas and dodge the, the the two dark areas and each print was unique in that sense because you're using your hands or little little hand, homemade tools to do that uh and yeah it, it, some of my stuff has upwards of 20 25 dodges and burns wow so um digital technology has uh, scanners have a much wider dynamic range so once i started going digital it's been easier to i mean there was just stuff that i just never wanted to print or just was like this just don't didn't have the time whereas it's great now with digital scanning to go back and see all this this stuff that i i just ignored before because it was eh, it's too dark or it's too this or that did you keep majority of your um negatives from most of your career um, yeah, that's kind of what you'll, you'd see on the back wall behind me there, those gray boxes. Wow. Those are all negatives. Yeah. That's something I... W uh, let's see. There we go. Oh. Yeah. Wow. God, so. that's... You know, it's... Um, it, there was just... God, I loved... I, I don't know, developing the film, there was just such a process to it. What takes... You know, I can go photograph my son playing soccer, have that photo uploaded. I can, on the side of the field 
upload it on my laptop and have it nice and all ready to go in you know three minutes. There was such a God for one. If you really wanted that one good photo to come out in a dark room properly, I mean, you were you were in there. It was it's, it's hours worth of work, and I do. I just well, miss... and just just shooting itself was was just a guessing game, really, oh, yeah. compared to now because you didn't know until you went back and developed the film, and that's fraught with its own, you know potential for disaster uh and and i you know at the time i would have to kind of ration film you think like okay i can fit four in this canister it takes me an hour to get through this canister do i really want to shoot five rolls and then have to go another hour you know plus to develop that fifth roll i mean you just kind of do these mathematics in your head Oh, yeah. Um, or, or like, for example, my famous picture of, of Kurt on the drum kit at Raji's, that series where he's drum, jumping on the drum kit. I knew I had like about 10 frames left. I just kept, you know, looking down and I was like, there, he's starting to go nuts here. Like, okay, I don't want to, you know, use these up on the first part of him going nuts. And I just had to, and it's literally like, there's two frames after that series left. So. There you yeah, go. That is wow. It, it's it's you know. And I knew I was like, okay, if I'm in the middle, I don't want to be in the middle of changing roles while he's doing whatever. So, yeah. Now, did you shoot primarily uh, 35 millimeter back then, or did you? Or were you doing? Or you was it? Did you have the ability to shoot 120 at that time too? I, I shot. I had a Hasselblad um, fairly early on. And uh, so that, but uh, you know, I just use that for portrait and studio stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I don't know. It's it's beautiful. I, there's something just so beautiful about black and white work. I, I I just I don't know. There's it just it just I don't know. It, and it's it's hard to like mirror that now unless you are shooting in black and white. But like I mean, there's just there's differences now like with the digital black and white than it was actual film. Black and white film is just something special. Mm -hmm. But but this is great. But it is funny to think like you know when I was shooting you know when I would shoot I would have a digital camera and film. So like if I knew I was low on things like I got the digital to, to not have to worry about that. But to think like all right I got ten. I couldn't. I never thought about it. Like that's interesting that you had to like sit yeah, there. Yeah yeah you know you had to you had to really mentally prepare for when you were going to change roles out during a during a show. You know. And you had to be quick at it. Yeah. I mean, just oh. really, you're just winding on. and Or, or you know, there was one time at Mud Honey Show where everything was just going freaking nuts. And I was like, and I'm like shooting and shooting. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I'm like at 40, you know, it kind of runs out, the, even the counter on the camera. And I'm like, ah, oh, crap. And I look and I never caught it up this, on the spool to begin with. Mm. So yeah, it was it was you know it was it was pretty fraught that way with 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 things that could go wrong. And did but you? But that gives us it gave, gave it its special uniqueness too. I mean, it's just a, a special quality to shooting that way, and I'm glad I had that experience. Though I haven't now, shot a roll of film in like ten years. So. That was about to ask you that. Yeah. I mean, it, well, first of all, it is yeah. film is super expensive. Everything oh, yeah. about it is is so. I mean, everything is shot up tremendously because there's only so many factories actually producing the film and the chemicals to develop it's it. It's like vinyl. You know? it, it is. It is in its own way. It's kind of like you know, like Polaroids. Like my son wanted a Polaroid camera, and I'm like, what, what? Why? Like, why? Why do you want a Polaroid camera? I'm like, you you literally have a phone that takes care of all that for you. And he's like, oh, it's, uh -huh. well, dad, it, it prints it automatically. I'm like, well, I know what a Polaroid camera does. I had it when I was little. I don't, you don't have to explain this to me. Um, but no, it is interesting how like things recycle itself back. But no, there, there's an, there's, I don't know. I just like the idea of like touching and, and developing and, and actually pulling it together than everything being so digital. Um, but wow, that, that is, that is crazy. Now, let me ask you this. We're going to be jumping all over the place, I feel like, tonight. And I apologize ahead of time to anyone because I have so many thoughts and questions for Charles. Um, but when you're looking at, like, that Nirvana shot of Kurt going through the drum set, um, which I'll pull back up again here, do you, you know, f photographing film and stuff like that and going through those roles, I'm assuming you went through that role, re like, you know, again later down the road when you were able to digitize it. Do you go behind and retouch that up from on a digital perspective ever again, or do you still use the original dodge and burn that you did for that when you did it in the dark room years ago? No, no, no. I I, I rescan everything and then and then 
finessed it to the point where it looks like a digital or a, a darkroom print, you know, the same. So I use, I use lassos and, and, um, yeah, then, you know, layers to, to bring up or bring down, you know, areas. Uh, but you know, it's not as imperfect looking, but, uh, just for, for the, for the sake of then going on to make another digital print, it works. It, it worked out the best. Yeah. Going from the original negative. I had an Imacon scanner up until last year, um, which is a $10,000, $12,000, uh, kind of desktop drum pseudo drum scanner and then the motherboard went last year mm. but um i got a good 16 years out of it so <laughs> now when did you in your career realize that you're gonna have to start teaching yourself to go from a film-based system to digital that yeah, was a r early 2000s right around 2004 2005 i still shot film up to a point and then i did a few jobs and it was just like jesus what you know what i'm spending on film and processing and then having to go scan it or print it uh you know i may as well just yeah, get a digital camera so i mean just none of them at that point except none of them were good enough as far as i was concerned um so they are now yeah <laughs> and what do you typically shoot with uh, I like a M10 these days. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now I have a Nikon, Nikon for whatever, but it's I shoot with a Leica. I'd say ninety percent these now. Even uh -huh. even stuff like Pearl Jam or the home shows or whatever, I'll shoot with a Leica. You know, I have a Nikon with a long lens, but primarily, yeah. Yeah. Right. Now I sh I have a Nikon D4. Um, is what I typically mm -hmm. shoot, shoot with, and I'm a big fan of that. Um, and you know, contra photography, I'm usually what seventy, you know, the seventy to two hundred millimeter, like two point eight, is what I'm, you know, I go for as best I can, depending on size of venue and stuff. But I uh, know I'm a big, I'm a big, big Nikon guy. All right, now let's roll it back a little bit. So, for photography, you'll love. You start deciding that you learn that from your uncle. You're going through, and you find that this is what you, this is all you know. This is what you want to do. And you said that early on in, in your, you know, your teenage years that you had friends that were in bands. And that's when, you, I guess, that you started f photographing concerts at the time? Yeah. I, I, you know, I was, I was always into music as a, as a teenager. And then it was about, I guess I must have been 17 when I was sort of, I discovered the, the punk thing. I'd say this was, what, 1981? Yeah, 80, 81. Uh, so then I started going to shows downtown. I lived in the suburbs, started going to shows downtown. And, uh, yeah, it was right about that time. I, 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 did, I didn't shoot a lot. You know, I was kind of a shy kid, believe it or not. Um, but, and still, I have still a difficulty going out doing street photography, that sort of thing. It's just not my, not my, my deal, but uh, I think the first show that I shot was maybe like Susie and the Banshees, um, you know, just just weird stuff like a couple local new wave bands at the you know wherever at Seattle Center or something, you know, just just yeah, experimenting. And then it wasn't until getting into college and then meeting Mark Arm and uh, there was a local club, the Metropolis, uh, you know, various places around that. Uh, that's sort of when I was like, okay, yeah, I want to set I sort of early on. So I was like, told myself, I want to set out to make like the best live photograph ever. So, I don't know if I've accomplished that. Well, I was about to not, ask it. I'm like, have, have, in your like, mind, that, you know, it's a, it's a goal there. You in your something. mind, have you, had, do you think you've done that yet? I, yeah, I, I don't believe in best per se now that I'm, I'm, you know, older, but, uh, I think, uh, I think I did the best I could. And I think I sort of renewed or re, I don't, I don't want to say reinvented, but, uh, I came up with something different. I, I feel that, that hadn't been going on before. So at least in the, at least in the genre that I was working within you know and what i had to work with i sure. wanted to do it do it differently i can understand that um, I, I i you know i was at the same time i was like like 
listening to Black Flag records, I was like going to, to European art films and reading or, and, and looking at Henry Cartier Brisson books. So, you know, that sort of all just kind of came together. No, that, that well, for, yeah, for, I wanted to make it art. I wanted to make this live photography as art. Yeah. First of all, I, I, I admire you saying that because I feel like some people, um, get into photography originally not for the art but for the money and especially nowadays i, I mean if people can just click you know, <laughs> yeah i wasn't into it for that that that's no, for no. sure <laughs> but i mean <laughs> you know a lot you know and i've said this to other artists but I, I i mean this like you know when some people look you know me i'm 36 i know you're just a little bit older than me um and we look at you know like the people grow up and they look at certain artists and stuff like that and they admire them like I remember in college and having to do retrospectives and look at people and and kind of like mirror things. Like I looked at the Karen Mason Blairs, the Lance Mercers, or Charles Petersons, you know, uh, the Danny Clinches and stuff, and and you know, even like the Natalie Andrews and and things like that. Like that were in like these weird scenes at the time that were that were things. And you know, people looked and when those people were growing up, they were looking at like the Picassos and stuff. So like my art world was revolved around like what you guys were putting on paper. I looked at that as art. So, mm -hmm. you know, and some people, you know, they're like, oh, it's different. Well, it's not because it's just different times. And th as we generationally grow, art becomes different in different formats. To me, looking at your work and looking at all these people's work, that was art to me because there was a beauty behind that. Um, and I'm going to, I'm actually. Yeah, there's gonna... a, there is an in intention to it. I think that's what's most important is that you have Correct. an intention and a, and a, and, and, and a, and a vision, you know, um, that, that's that's cohesive as well. I think that's that's important. Well, sure. Listen, you know anybody can paint a picture, right? You can go to Michael's up the road. You can get a paint and you can paint a picture and and make it kind of visible. There's Shamu, right? There, there's a whale jumping out the water. That I pay and it, and it's good. It's there. But then there's people that take the time and the thought process to make it so it looks realistic. It comes out. There's someone right now who can go to Walmart and go get themselves a camera and take a picture when they see a band. And okay, there's Eddie playing on stage, or there's Chris, whoever on stage, right? Well, then there's the people that are like, all right, well, I'm going here. I have this. I have that. I'm gonna pull this in. I'm gonna set my ISO, drop it down. I'm gonna actually add some green to do different things to make that picture exactly what's in your head. But in the the only difference is you only have seconds to make that happen where a painting takes a little bit longer, but yeah, no, I've always admired. Well, that. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's moving away from the representational, you know, and that's sort of what I always wanted to do. I wanted to, I didn't want this to be about rock stars. Well, I mean, initially they weren't rock stars. They were just my friends playing in a little club and experimenting themselves. And I was just sort of experimenting myself. And it was great not being beholden to, to anyone at that point, you know, uh, there was no photographer photographers are always at this the spearhead point of you know any any big job or anything like that it's it's quite stressful because it's there can literally be millions of dollars under that pyramid and that's you performing You're probably getting paid the least of 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 everyone at times um so it was great to not have that any sort of that sort of pressure like oh god i need to deliver a magazine cover or something like that no it was just like if i want to cut their heads off if i want to just you know uh blur it so that you can't even hardly see them whatever it's like i could i could do that you know yeah you know yeah no i i totally i totally see that and i see that in your work when did you realize photographing all these bands and um and and coming through that like you got something I mean, there had to be a moment where you're like, I'm doing something right because look look at what I'm producing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, sometimes you're just, I was so busy at that point. It just, I, I kind of wish I could have stepped back a little, little more. But it was certainly, um, you know, it was th that shot of Kurt Cobain on his shoulders at the Commodore. That, that, that was like, wait a minute, this... This is really what I'm looking, starting to look for here. Uh, that, that Mud Honey Super Fuzz Big Mop cover shot as well. Uh, I think you had that earlier. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it took a little bit of convincing the band to use this photo uh, at the time. And because there were still, 
even as somebody out there is mud honey, there's still some egos involved, you know, with bands like, oh God, you know, not everyone's in it, or uh, we don't want to have anybody in it and use art, you know, illustration or whatever. So, uh, or, and so this where it's like, it was entirely, to me, this was something entirely new that I hadn't seen before. Mm. Um, you know, uh, the one interesting part looking at this photo, and it kind of ties in the story. I'm just going to say it one more time. We talked about beforehand. You know, when I was in college and I was taking uh, fine arts, my you know art teacher had told me he's like, you know, you know, Native Americans didn't want their photos taken because they believed that taking a photo of them was taking a piece of their soul, like they, it was taking a part of them, you know. And it wasn't until later on that you know they adapt the idea to being like living forever, like you're taking a piece of them, but then that story of them is translating to moving on and on and on, um, which is clever because in in theory, like I don't have a lot of pictures of like a lot of my earlier ancestors, but I do with you know my father and grandfather. Um, so I, it's easier to tell stories. Where in this, I've seen this picture on album covers. I've seen it in magazines. I've seen it on T-shirts of kids. I mean, you know, this this image has been around the world and then some a hundred thousand times, and been seen by billions of people. And it just not only incorporates a legacy of the band, but the hard work behind it for you to capture that, which is like you said you changed the game I, and I've, i said this on the karen mason blair interview i've always incorporated that the eyes of seattle when it came to you and karen mason blair at, at a very critical time in music that was very important to the growth and development of what would become grunge and that hard scene out of seattle was seen through yours and karen's lenses and lance mercer and alice wheeler and a few other people yeah but um yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I, 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 for me, it was always about lighting. Uh, well, there's lighting, composition, and then moment, and the the three have to come together. Uh, and and the moment, the the lighting is what gives the emotion, and the composition is what sort of, I don't know, to me, kind of stirs the stirs the brain, sort of. And then it's the moment that tells the story. And I think to me, a great photo tells a story just sort of in and of itself. Um, you know, there's no no words needed. Like the the best compliment I ever got was from a woman in her 80s at the, uh, I had a museum exhibit at an old school uh, museum back east, the Norfolk in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And she was on the board and she at lunch one time I was there and she came up to me and she was like, you know, I don't know anything about rock and roll, but I feel like I do now. Wow. So, yeah. And that's, you know, it's sort of like war photography. Like I hope never have never experienced war and I hope I never will or anyone I know will, you know, but uh, that's what a great war photographer does is they, they bring that experience to you so that, you know, hopefully we can never have wars again. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just it's like yeah, a great photo tells the story. No no words no words necessary. I, I, you said it beautifully, you nailed it right on the head when you when you really think about that. I mean, because a lot of your 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 photos, especially going through you know your website and looking at your portfolio uh, of everything from your grunge, your travel to even um, your your cinema work, everything it really is like it's just it's it's captured in a way that it does it. They all tell a story. Um, I think that's another reason why people obsess with you know photos nowadays, whether it's in a good way or a bad way, whether it's social media or not, is because they believe that that is portraying them in a way that tells a story, whether it's true or not. That's a, that's up for debate for, you know, the things, but it is, and you know, that's what photography is. It's just, it's, it's, it's using one thing to tell a story and, and a million people can dic dictate it in different ways, but it's just learning from that. And, and, you know, I've always, I always set out to, to try and I love iconic photographs. I, I've always been a try. And so I, as well, like I said, I wanted to set out to take an iconic, photograph to, to sort of change the change the game and and just sort of whatever whatever i do it's like don't i don't you know it could be the most mundane thing but don't hold back it's like you know use use your senses use use what's around the composition the negative space the light 
the, and then the moment, of course, to try and make it more universal, bigger, beyond just sort of representing something or, you know, having this sort of internal meaning that, that nobody else would care about. You know, like we were talking earlier before the show and I said, yeah, I've got like 60 to 90,000 pictures of my kids, you know, but I've boiled that down to about 25 or 30 pictures of that that would actually have meaning be in a larger sense beyond that in a universal way, you know, sort of tapping back into your own childhood, whether you've had kids or not. So it's not about my kids. It's about the experience of being a kid or you know, uh, just using light and keeping them anonymous, just sort of like that mud honey photo and just, yeah, using the light and space and, and moments. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I, I do want to step back to something you said just a, a few moments ago. You had said that, you know, your goal was to, um, to, to get capture an iconic photo. Um, in my, in my personal opinion uh, and take this for whatever it is, um, just the guy behind the microphone, I, I would say that I would think that you have, you know, if this was baseball in theory and scoring, you've hit quite a few home runs in its own, <laughs> in its own retrospect. When you look at the body of work you have done and then some, cause there's a lot of things out there, you know, in moments like this, that, I mean, this is, I mean, once again, it's almost, you know, the way that this, this everything is done in this photo and it's and in theory right in the theory of photography this isn't a perfectly shot photo right like there's not like there there's definitely things that you would like you know maybe i'm saying this wrong not perfectly shot where in sense of like everything lines up correctly that there's definitely things this artistic eye to it and stuff that that makes it its own perfect way that is just that only showcases it as a charles peterson piece that comes through that this piece has been seen by billions of people that absolutely adore this piece that's that's shared in millions of homes around the world that are up on walls you know this the the one of the secrets is that i would say in this picture is 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 one of that is a lot of times i don't look through the viewfinder so you know i was i was holding that if you look at the angle on this shot i was holding the camera up you know um, probably a little bit over my head here like that because I, I definitely was not taller than chris on a stage <laughs> he's chris you know, it was only a two the vogue was only a two foot stage or something but there was a stage so yeah i'm i'm holding it up over the camera over my head i'm not uh and you know and again that's a really risky risky thing to do but if you do it long enough you you you, you get it you get the so, feel yeah you got the feel for it, um, and it. Uh, and then and then you're not then you're not you you let go like you, you sort of let go a little bit. You have to. It's really important, I think, for in photography for a certain type of photography, of course, to get loose. Um, you know, you gotta just just if you stay loose, particularly with this sort of thing. Then, then you start getting unexpected little magical things happening, you know, uh, that that you only really kind of discover after the fact. Yeah, and that was I think that's one of the cool things too about it's like the whole Shamu theory. It's like you know back in the day when you went to go to you know Sea World and you took a photo of Shamu, you took the shot, you hope you got it. Like nowadays, you can take ten thousand photos before it even hits the water. But it, it, but the magic of like waiting, developing, and seeing that is it's what's iconic. And you know, it, it, I don't know. I just look at pictures, like, and you know, it's 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 you know, looking at that and thinking of Chris in its own sense too. And you know, that memory. It's like, you know, this is a story that lives on forever, based off photos like that, and it keeps his his memory and his and his music and everything continuing to roll and almost in sync with things. It is beautiful. In yeah, its own no, sense. I mean, it's a great. It's I love the way that that is sort of. It creates a little cyclone there with Hero in the back and then Kim on the other side there. Uh, you know, there's just, yeah, there's a lot going on. And, and again, too, also the, 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 the trick is, I said, lighting, which I would use yeah. a flash on a cable. So I was, as I had the camera over my head, I had the flash. You can kind of see off to his, off to his right would be his right side there, my left side. Uh so it, it gives a, it models it. It's not just this blaring kind of straight ahead shot. Uh, 
and you know the clubs of course were, were quite dark back then this is all you know now yeah now even small clubs with led lights and high iso cameras there's there's tons of light it sure. seems uh so uh and then yeah leaving the shutter open and just you know not doing it too long not too 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 little to get that blurry effect uh okay no that's that that is I've, I, that, that, no, it's absolutely beautiful shot. That is, uh, that is, that is a special one for sure. Um, we do have some questions coming in. So as questions are coming in, I'm going to pull them up. Um, one, sure. <laughs> one person wanted to know. Karen wants to know how much beer was dumped on you while you were changing rolls of film. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Karen. Um, it happened. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I, at the Pussy Galore show, I threatened a couple guys with my with my camera because they were. <laughs> spill it they were like spilling beer all over me and i'm just like fucking grabbed one and it's like knock this off right now <laughs> oh man oh, um, and, I, and i had you know occasionally you know if i did use my flash on the camera because sometimes it was just got hard holding it out all the time sure um i got it knocked off a couple times by stage oh. diver the, the foot would break and yeah uh at the so the the Sub pop, soda pop, or uh, coca show, I guess. Larry Reed called it soda pop after sub pop. But uh, Larry, it was local arts maven, and it was a uh, Mud Honey uh, sub pop showcase two nights. The second night was Nirvana. And Larry had the bright idea of throwing powdered sugar everywhere. Oh. And there were literally, you could see like condensation coming down the walls. Oh, and man. it just got and the next morning my camera was just totally frozen up oh. and i took it to the repair place and the guy takes it to the back and he brings it out and he's like did you did you pour soda pop all over this and i just started laughing um oh, that's t- yeah, yeah that sucks oh and that was a, that back then that was a big 200 hundred dollar repair that was the month's <laughs> rent you know yeah, that's that really sucks Man, I can only imagine. Um, let's go to this question, and then we'll go. We'll continue on. We'll come back to some of these questions too. Were there any shows, Brad asks? Were there any shows you wish you would have stuck around for instead of leaving after the job was done? Mm, good question. Um, yeah, you know, in fact, um, lately I've got this sort of big thing coming up that I'm not really uh, going to talk about, but uh, okay. and it kind of involves this some of what the before and after stuff okay and i didn't do i didn't do enough of that and i wake up in the morning now thinking about like oh my god there was that time you know uh yeah yeah uh it it just again like i said i was i wasn't i was i was a little bit shy for whatever reason i was a little bit shy or just not it just wasn't on my radar that that stuff was going to be as important um as it was sort of getting that perfect what i wanted to do getting that perfect live shot and again it was a lot of setup with the camera with the cables and et cetera, et cetera. so and then often to get the spot at the stage you would you know have to sort of abandon your friends or whoever and go reserve that spot in the front of the stage mm-hmm. uh-huh uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this. Did you ever have the opportunity of photographing Elton John live? No. Uh-uh. All right. I, I, so, quick story. Um, I, I, maybe you'll appreciate this. You know, Typically, when you photograph concert, you get the first three songs. It's usually the, the go-to key. You get the first three songs, and then you're out, and the band doesn't want it. For Elton John that night, it was certain songs we were allowed to photograph. There was four of them. It was the first song. It was like the sixth song. It was like the eighth song, and then it was like the last song. And the way that he had it was, as a, you can only go in front once the song started. So it was like a mad dash of like 11 of us trying to get in to take a photo and talking about breaking your camera. I'll never forget it. It was Crocodile Rock, and it, as we were going in, I had I had my uh, my vest on, my two cameras, and my 70 to, my 70 to 200 ran right into another photographer and the whole front Oof. of it just cracked the lens. And ever since then, I've had a hard time listening to Elton John. It's just been, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't, I can't, you know, like that croc, me and Crocodile Rock are just, we do, we do not, we, I, I think, I think of that $3,200 purchase again and it just, it, it, it kind of upsets me. 
Who, oh God, why is his name escaping me? Uh, Muskrat Love. Who is that guy? Uh, Kenny Loggins. <laughs> yes. Uh, I photographed Kenny Loggins at the Puyallup Fair one time. And uh, do one of these just super random, random jobs. Uh, and this is like the, 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 I don't know if you would know what the Puyallup Fair is, but it's just a fair. It's like, you know, and then they have entertainment in the evenings. And okay. so I was there and I was in the middle of the aisle because he kind of went up through the crowd at the end and then he was going back down and I was sort of like following him up and then fall. And I just got like literally mobbed by women with flowers. Just, they just ran over me. I just had to like kind of collect my stuff in and just as they ran with their flowers toward throwing them. And it was just, it was crazy. Oh, that, that. And, and then later on, it was for the record label. And then later on, uh, for whatever reason, I saw an advertisement for his record. And okay. you never see a photographer credit on, you know, uh, advertisements. And there was a photo by Charles Peterson for Kenny Loggins. It was so, wow. It's kind of hilarious. L- let me ask you this. Did you ever photograph someone and not know who it was or what they looked like prior to going to the show? Uh, yeah. Uh, Outcast. Okay. Uh, I shot the video, Hey Ya, and Big Boy's video the next day. Did you really? That's, yeah. And that's... I really did not know <laughs> until I, I, kind of, I, I got it once Andre came on set and was, <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, that's the dude. And it was pretty easy to figure out, but no, I, I, in fact, I, I, for a couple of years running, I photographed at uh, at Sun Sundance mm-hmm. um, for the Bing Bar. There, uh, my I had a brother in law who sort of put all that on. So I was trying to just do a fly on the wall thing, not the usual uh, uh, step and grin or whatever. Uh, just I was there, but I was like doing the weird angles and and getting you know. But I would I drove the publicist crazy because I didn't know who anybody was. You know, I just don't follow popular culture kind of like that. And, and, uh, she's like, well, yeah, of course they're I'm like, I don't know. Entourage. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Like, you know, I don't know. Oh. And, and then I'd, be like, oh, look at this. I'd show the publicist, like, look at this cool picture I got. And they're like, oh God, they would hate that. I'm like, <laughs> no, but look at the angles. And yeah, oh, well, I'll, so I'll t- it just was not, it's not the, the whole celebrity thing and me. It just, I don't know. It's kind of accidental. Let's put it that way. Well, I'll give you a last story about me because I, I don't want to about me. But I, I'm really nerding out with the fact that I can talk to someone about these moments and have someone that appreciates it. But um, so, like I was telling you before the show, like I, most of the things I photographed in this area was country based because that middle of Virginia in the South that's that's what pulls around here. And you know, typically when you go to shows for one of the venues, they'd be like, "Well, we'll pay you this much, or we'll give you two tickets and this much." And usually, I just gave up on the tickets because I didn't want to go see the act. So an artist was coming through named Blake Shelton. I knew nothing (laughs) of the artist at all, knew nothing about him. My wife went nuts. Says, I want the, can you get me the ticket for me and my sister? This is right in the heydays of when FaceTime had just came out. So the way that the Roanoke Civic Center works is the photographers meet the back door. You actually go backstage and you hang back there in a red room. And that's where they break down. They give you like your passes and all that stuff. Well, as we're back there in the parking lot area where the buses were, there was a gentleman smoking barbecue, like he just having a good time, choking. And I'm ta- I've been talking to this guy 20 minutes, not, never knew who it was. Wife FaceTimes me, talking to her and stuff like that. And her face like goes, what? She goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm just eating some barbecue. I said, the show don't go on for the 30 minutes. It's like, who's that behind you? I said, it's the chef. Why? She goes, no. That's, <laughs> she, goes, she goes, that's Blake Shelton. So she, he waves, says it. For, 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 I had no idea for the whole time. And I, and I never mentioned music to the guy. I never mentioned it. The whole time, we're just, I was I'm like, oh, this barbecue's really good. I'm like, have you been on the road long? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. Oh, that's cool. He's, and he's like, what are you here for? I said, oh, I'm photographing the act and stuff. I said, oh, okay, cool. He goes, you excited? I said, I said, yeah, I'm not really big into music and, you know, country music, but, you know, it, it does a thing. And my wife's here and she's excited about the act. She's like, oh, cool. And we just, we talked, I think we talked about like my son and we talked. But like for the whole time, never knew who the guy was, and then it, then like the next year he was on like that show with the button and the te- the sh- the chair. So that's my um, funny. I had no idea who the hell the person was until uh, my wife FaceTimed me and yeah, Blake Shelton. And, co- and it would have been a, a very different thing probably if you'd, if you'd 
pulled out your camera and flash or whatever and started going at it, you know? So yeah. it's nice to just have that, that human interaction. Yeah. yeah. Like for the good old, good old days. But all right, now let's get back into some of these photos and then we'll get in some more questions. because I've seen a bunch pop up as well. Um, this is another one of my favorite photos that you've taken because of the fact that like, it's, 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 it's a capturing a moment that most people would just look past where there's an art behind it and a beauty behind it. Can you talk a little bit about this photo of uh, Kurt? Yeah. So this was at the Reading festival in 1992. And, um, I'd say this was probably, you know, about a third of the way through the gig or so. And Mark arm is sitting to my, I'm, sitting we're at the side of the stage mark arm is sitting to my right and there's uh, i think uh eric erlinson is videotaping you know from hole to my left and then stage drops off about 15 feet down okay uh and at just one point in between songs kurt just stopped and he like looked over and he was like kind of mouth like you know everything okay like what do you guys think you know sort of thing and uh, like great thumbs up now freaking go <laughs> back and do it you know uh but it was so it was a great moment because it was sort of like i don't know it was like despite the fact there was you know he was playing to forty five thousand people he just wanted to sort of check in on us and and make sure that everything was was okay yeah. No, that's th no, that's pretty astounding. Also, I know I'm frozen up. I have no idea what's going on. Just enjoy my terrible facial expression in in frozen moment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that no, that, that's pretty. Amazing. So, Reading Festival with you know, there was a quote put out the other day about Kurt Cobain about how short his career was, and you were a big part of it because you did see a lot of his music um from earlier days through the way through the way through especially in in a lot of his big moments what was it like to kind of ride that wave of um you know seeing kurt in his and through his different processes through his career um you know i never you know he was nirvana was kind of a late comer to the scene so he had he definitely had more of a meteoric rise than than the rest of them uh he just yeah he went from being the, the kind of the shy kid in the corner of the party to to uh uh yeah the biggest rock star in the world so it it was it was both great and awful yeah yeah um, uh, it, it is you know i see some of those i i didn't yeah i see like the, those later pictures and i just was like oh god he looks terrible you know, he just looks terrible. Mm. Those the the Jesse Froman stuff, and you know, with the sunglasses, and he just looks like death warmed over. So that's kind of not the the Kurt that I like to recall. Sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I worked I worked with him primarily more early on. No, that's yeah. It, it is. It is. I understand what you're saying, but it is. The, looking through your work and seeing all the different years and the avenues and different career specs of of what he did, it was it's interesting that your your take on him, I, I you know, or, or many people's different takes on him, but yours in in general of how you visualized him because it was it's you know it's different how people can look at an artist and 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 photograph him over that time because his workload or how many years he was doing it is it was short. So there's so many photos out there. You can kind of capture his whole career through him and the different views or takes that photographers took to capture him. It was, you know, was special in its own sense. Yeah. I mean, he, it, you know, at a certain point, um, uh, he was being photographed practically by every photographer in the world that you can think of that somehow involved in the music biz, you know, or even peripherally involved, uh, uh and uh i know he liked photographers he did he did enjoy he enjoyed photography himself and in fact i have a a camera on my shelf here that he he lent to me because he wanted me to it's a stereo realist um he wanted me to figure out how to get film for it and and all that and you know which i was looking into then he then he killed himself uh, so did yeah. you did you ever use that camera 
No, no, I never could figure out how to get it to work. So I think it, it takes some sort of weird, weird film. Yeah. Uh, wow. That's a, that's a pretty special piece right there. Um, mm -hmm. Let's dig into some more of these questions. Then we're going to jump into some more photos. Um, do most people want to hear more of, of the backstory about your photos or just keep their own interpretations? Interesting. Um, no, I think people. I think people like to hear the the backstory for sure. Um, I I I think that sometimes the backstory is 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 more disappointing though than the than the actual photo itself. So, uh, you know, I, I have a really hard time coming up. You know, sort of like, oh yeah, well, it was like when Mick and Keith were. I was hanging out with Mick and Keith and blah blah blah, and then we went off here. It's like I don't have that sort of stuff. So I kind of like to. You know, let the the pictures speak for themselves more. Oh. All right. Um, Matt wants to know favorite bands and current new band recommendations. Oh boy! Uh, uh, trying to I I trying to think. Uh, I'm terrible with names. So uh, yeah. Oh, uh, 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 my favorite thing right now is a uh, LA artist. Uh, Rushi Jane, uh, okay, J A I N, and it's it, she's like a mix. Be, I'd say a mix between, like, uh, like the synthesizer kraut rock artist Klaus Schultz and Anusha Shankar and Brian Eno. Um, it's really amazing kind of chill out music that's 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 also somewhat complex and difficult. Uh, I listen to a lot of kraut rock. Uh, listen to a lot of classical these days, and new classical. Um, um, yeah, I've got weird, weird music tastes. Um, one of my <laughs> favorites last year was was Jackie Lynn. Okay. Uh, which out of I think they're out of Chicago, which is another kind of they were another kind of. Uh, sort of that kraut rocky kind of thing but more sort of if you took like americana and disco and put it together i don't know um that's an interesting ten, uh, tenger out of south korea which is a husband and wife duo that creates sort of uh, droney kraut rock as well uh, yeah it's just I I've, I kind of needed I, this last couple of years especially I, for whatever reason I kind of needed to turn towards more um, instrumental music uh, and just just stuff to like I don't know chill me out from everything else going What's on going in the on world. world yeah I can yeah. I can I can totally understand that so um, I have to, I have to say I I did put on Super Fuzz Big Muff a couple of days ago and that that I have to say that's still one of my favorites so of all time yeah that is a that is an absolute great album um i'm gonna pull up um another photo here that i think is one i love this photo and maybe you can explain you know the the process behind this one a little bit and i'm gonna do a different view while i work to get my video back up so this is absolutely amazing yeah so this this i would consider uh probably the most iconic photograph that I took. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's, I'm sure everyone has seen it. It's, it's been used in a lot of places. It was used as a key, key art backdrop on the movie. This is 40. And, uh, you know, it's it murals around town and yeah. Uh, it just, you know, it just didn't, a lot of people have, so a few people mistakenly think that's Kurt Cobain, but it's not. It, it was just uh, somebody in the crowd that climbed to the top of the PA. And I asked, I pulled on his pant leg and was like, don't do it. Please don't do it because I thought he's going to break his neck and then the whole thing would just come to an end. But uh, and then he, he shook his head, he's like, no. And I'm like, all right. So, you know, I set up for the shot, got one chance. That is no, yeah. it, it is 24 it is a, millimeter. It just, yeah, no, that is a stunning picture. And it, it, it just, I don't know, it describes the, the, you know, what 
I don't know. It's just there's something special about about that um, and how that looks and 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 the story it kind of tells um, at that time. You know, it just it feels well, like. It, 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 Whenever you get a sea of faces like that, uh, no matter the, the, the environment or the subject, uh, it's, it's very powerful because uh, particularly when those faces aren't looking at the camera, because you're able to go in and see this this really precise slice of moment of time. And, and each person and face has a story to it in a way, you know, seeing they're all especially in this one, because they're all pointing in different directions. You know, if they were all if they were all sort of arms up towards him, I don't think it would be as powerful as the fact that he's just diving into this sort of chaos and you have no idea whether he's going to get caught or not. You know, um, it is it is. Yeah. it. You know, I don't think I mean, I haven't been to a show like that ever. Like I've never seen anything, anything like that before. Um, so it is it's amazing seeing that and what. You know, it is it is the where people are looking. There's so much to observe with that. It almost reminds me, of, especially in the background. You ever see those pictures of like the animals in the woods? Like you just see their eyes. Almost, it's like there's a lot of like just visualizations of things. It's it's really wild. Not that, that's that's up there. Let me ask you this: When you look back at your collection of work, and you think of everything you've done up to this point, because um, you you still have a long career ahead of you. Is there something that sticks out that you're most proud of? Uh, I, yeah, I think we just looked at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, just just those iconic photos that I took like that, and and uh, you know, the ones that, like you said, have sort of become household names i mean i can't help but but be proud of them and, and that fact uh-huh no that's that's no that's it's, it, you know because i mean I, I i like to ask like is there like something like people are like this is what i want to be known for this is the piece that defines what i think that you know i live for and i love the fact that like most like i said i know people assume that's kurt i'm glad i'm glad that was cleared up because i knew that i had read somewhere online that 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 you know there was mixed interpretations but no, it's it is just it just stands out that piece for sure. I mean, it, it's it's it can always be somewhat frustrating that uh, you know, like like a band that always has to go out and play their first single, you know, for the rest of their life. Mm. You know, uh, but at a certain point, you know, I think you go through stages. At one point, you kind of have to like reject it, then like. And then you realize, shit, like, if I don't play that single, like, the, the band, the audience is just not, they're not going to come back for the next show, you know? Uh, so it's sort of like Mud Hunting with Touch Me, I'm Sick or something. Um, you know, they're probably sick to death of that song, but they, they still, every show, they play it. It's, you know, it still gets the... So, yeah, you, you get, no, you know, it's frustrating sometimes to be known pr only for these, these greatest hits. But, and then then you kind of go through a period of acceptance and go, wow, like it's great to be known for, for something, you know, anything. So sure. in that, in that way. Yeah. And, and, and that's a, you know, not, not everyone is. And so even if you're only known for that, it's a great, it's a great honor. Yeah. You no, know, I, 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 I think that's, that's a good way to think about it. I mean, you know, if you think about some of the greatest, painters or artists in the world i mean some of them you only know them for the for their few pieces but then the people that really appreciate those will start digging in and seeing the other stuff they've done and i would highly recommend um following charles on instagram and going to his facebook and going to his website and and digging into not just where it says grunge but everything else because i mean his his eye has captured so many beautiful things in this world um that that really i, I think people would appreciate and that takes me to this next photo which it is a greatest hits, um, as you would say, but I, it's one of my favorites of yours. And I and I've seen this photo, got a billion times, and I I can't wait to hear the story about this and a little bit more on this. This photo of Eddie Vedder, there you can the facial expression, the story behind it. You know, if you followed Pearl Jam as as most people that are you know on the, listening to the show now have you know about, you know, how he feels about things. There's so much to this picture and so much story to it that like, 
it, it's like it, it's kind of like that one question about interpretation of what it comes out as. Um, yeah, just tell me a little bit about this one. Okay, so this was the the free drop in the park show that they did in September of 1992 with 70,000 people, and uh, this was the actually the first time I photographed Pearl Jam. Uh, they were kind of like at the time there were this sort of the Nirvana Pearl Jam camp, you know, like <laughs> all these Pearl Jam guys, they just want to be stadium rockers, and then the Nirvana guys, yeah, they just want to be the the garage rockers. So stupid, uh, <laughs> it really was. And then and so then I went to this to, to shoot this, and uh, first thing like Eddie's like, hey, you're ch- hey, we're talking backstage before the show, and I took a couple pictures, and and then uh, man, when they went on, I was like. Cr- crap like this is one of the <laughs> best live bands i've ever seen you know like i still i'm just you know part of me is not the kind of into that stadium more more sort of that kind of rock and roll as much mm-hmm. as i would say mud honey or nirvana but um still it was like wow these guys put on an amazing show and of course i knew jeff and stone from from green river and back in the day uh so at one point Eddie climbs the scaffolding and he's got a really long uh, mic cable with him and he starts looping it around and I'm like, and I've got a 200 millimeter on and and just took, took these series of pictures here. I think this is the best one. Uh, But yeah, just, it shows that like grit and determination and just, and, and almost, almost anger there you know there's an anger as well like he's gonna you know i don't know it's it's intense it's an intense photo very intense photo um and then i all the whole time i'm taking these pictures i'm just in the back of my mind it's like jesus i hope they tested the tensile strength of that (laughs) mic cable you know (laughs) i hope he doesn't lose his grip or fall or whatever it was like all 70,000 people were thinking that because it was <laughs> it was a high high piece of scaffolding yeah. and then of course yeah then he swings then he swung down out over mm. the crowd yeah which i have a few shots like that as well but this oh. this of all of them this is the best as you grow and you photograph pearl jam quite a few times and you've done things or even like nirvana or any other bands as you grow was there was there ways that you could read the artist and see what they were doing to know that hey this he's gonna do this reading his body language so it prepared you to get those shots that you knew that you wanted to get out of the band Uh, yeah yeah definitely i mean it becomes it becomes easier the more and more you shoot you shoot the same the same band And, and pearl jam's you know great for photographers if if you're allowed to shoot the whole show because they have you know two 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 and a half hour three hour shows so i mean for example three years ago i shot the the stadium home shows here in seattle and then the two shows at fenway in boston and you know during a show i was able to be down in front and then run all the way back up to the top of the stadium and get the wide shots and then run back down and run, you know, walk around the audience, get shots there. And yeah, it was, you know, I even in Boston, I even went to the merch table during the show because there was such a line beforehand that, you know, I'm like, Oh, okay, well I'll just wait till they're playing, you know, <laughs> uh, can you really, I mean, you know, a three hour show it's, there's all, you know, there's only so many pictures you can take too. Sure. It's not like you're going to miss something per se. Yeah. When you, uh, uh, because Fenway is, that was, those are some of my favorite shows. I'm at, you know, I'm being from Boston and and having those two combined was, was a magical moment for me. Did you take advantage um, as a photographer? Did you happen to uh, go inside the green monster at all? I I didn't No, I was, didn't get a chance to, Uh. to do that. So yeah, you know, I just, I wasn't associated with the band per se with those, I just go and and shot those on my own, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, I'd say mo- most of this stuff that you, we've been looking at, I just did just to do. And then if something turned out, the bands would, you know, potentially use it, um, or I could sell prints or magazines or whatever. But 
uh, yeah, you just kind of, kind of had to, to, yeah, use your miles and, and, <laughs> get, get, start charging it. things. Yeah. Get those, get those air frequent flyer miles. I know that for yeah. sure. Um, is there an artist that you never had the opportunity to photograph that you wish you would have had of, would had done? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to think, I don't know, it doesn't come to the top of my head at the moment. Mm. Uh, is, is there anybody out there that you haven't worked with yet that you're hoping to? Uh, No. <laughs> Uh, well, my my nine year old daughter, she really hopes that I work with Taylor Swift, so uh, and that I, I get her into the show if she ever comes. But oh, uh, yeah, I I you you know I I'd kind of like to I'd kind of like to work outside of rock and roll more, um, you know, jazz or classical or I, I like challenges, you know. Sure. Um, and I think I've kind of done the rock and roll thing. Uh, not that I don't enjoy going to shows occasionally or shooting shows, you know, like I, I prefer something like Pearl Jam at Fenway where you've, you know, got this great big area and you've got access and, and all that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I like sort of like when I did the breakdancing series and book, um, you know, I just I challenged myself on that by shooting 120 medium format when I could very easily have just, you know, gunned it with a 35. But instead, it was like, yeah, I wanted to make these really elegant pictures of something that, that sort of, again, hadn't really been done before. So I shot it with medium format where you only get 12 shots a roll and then you've got this paper backing on the film and you're, you've are got to do all this thing while you're on a circle of kids, you know, who all want to be on the edge of the cipher. And who's this weird old guy, like shooting with this weird camera, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh -huh. I think, and I think that's really important for any, any photographer is to, to sort of, you know, to, to keep challenging themselves, keep sort of pushing, pushing the, the envelope. Most definitely. Let me run some through some of these questions because a couple have come up. Um, what do you miss most about the grunge scene? Steve wants to know. Uh, I would say just the uh, the at the time, just the fact that it was we sort of all knew each other, and it was you know very tight knit scene. Um, and at the time, yes, Seattle, like there were a lot of different circles, the, the sort of the art crowd and the grunge crowd. And then there was more of the garage rock crowd and, the, and uh, you know, and they all sort of all those circles sort of, you know, came together. And, and it, I remember my, my first wife, Susanna, who was from England and when we were dating, when she came to Seattle for the first time, I walked her down Pine Street from where I lived on Capitol Hill to, uh, to downtown. And, and she, she, apparently she started counting. And she said that in that stretch that we walked, we said hello to 25 different people. So, you know, it, at the time, Seattle was like that, that you just, everybody knew each other, whether you were gay, straight, grunge, whatever. So uh, it, it, was, it was fantastic that way. Hmm. Um. And I know you've been all over the world and you're taking your camera to so many different places. Um, removing talking about concerts just for a moment, what has been the most beautiful place you've photographed in the world? Uh, well, uh, my, I'd say my favorite place. to, Yeah, I would say Vietnam, part, parts of Vietnam, for sure. You know, particularly the... the the valleys up in the north with the terraced rice fields and the karst uh, formations and and I, I really enjoyed uh, photographing the yeah the ethnic minorities there um, yeah uh, you know a couple other places Hawaii was 
is we go every year and I've been sort of slowly but working on kind of some stuff there. Uh, Morocco again was was a really drop dead beautiful place. So hmm. got uh, a few. Dale says go to Laos. L A O S. I I have been to Laos. Uh, yeah, Luang Prabang was was definitely one of my favorite places to to shoot. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Brad wants to know: Did you shoot shoot Bowie? I never shot David Bowie. There's somebody who would have been fantastic to to photograph. I mean, there's I yeah I could go back and I mean, of course, think yeah. of all these yeah classic classic rockers that would have been fun to to shoot. I spoke to a future guest that photograph Bowie. I'm a big Bowie fan and Brad who mentioned it knows I think that's why I said that. Um and he talked about Bowie and how like the he didn't like there was no work behind like but there was just some like Bowie was his own character and it was just like you didn't have to like there was no like the photo shoot he did with him there was no direction it was just like just be you and Bowie knew exactly what that meant and it was just like this it was just perfect it was just I don't know there there was that he's a once in a lifetime person well you know you know Bowie typically nailed the vocal track on the first take that is, it's it's isn't that doesn't that like it drive you like I mean here heroes heroes he literally wrote in the bathroom walked out in the studio and nailed it on the first take or like, or yeah. Or did you hear the interview with uh, uh, Robert Plant where he's like, because they were asking about Stairway to Heaven and like, please describe to us the details that went into that. He's like, um, well, I wrote it in, I don't know, like eight minutes and uh, they we just put a couple guitar tracks and it just all kind of came together and I don't know, we did it in two takes. And I'm like, wait a minute, like I can barely put together a functional show that I'm doing right now in the hour and 10 minutes we talked, but this guy makes this magnificent one of the most perfect songs in the world and it, it's like nothing to him it's just heroes another beautiful song or like queens you know we will rock you like just it's, it's well, mind blowing again that's you know it's an, an artist being so immersed in what they're doing at that time and being sort of at the top of their game mm-hmm. that that it just it, that's just sort of how it naturally comes whether you know and I think that's true with photographers as well um you know, uh, like at that at that point, the, these photos we were looking at, you know, I was really, yeah, I was kind of at the top of my game doing this sort of one one fairly specific thing. You know, I wasn't at the t- necessarily at the top of my game doing studio portrait work, something I never really enjoyed that much, but had to do for, you know, reasons. Sure. Uh, whereas other photographers, you know, would that was their forte. Mm. Uh, and you sent them to a live show and they wouldn't know what to do for the life of them. So it's, yeah, it's really having that one sort of specific task that you know how to do well. And oh, I just, I wish it. I had the, I wish I was as creative as Brad said. Dolly Parton wrote Jolene and I always love you on the same day. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. Right, let's get let's finalize some of these questions um, and then we'll talk about your show in Seattle. Um, how much work haven't we seen? Are there any plans to release future books? Uh, yeah, there's actually a lot of work that hasn't been seen. Um, and I do have plans uh, for, for a book. Uh, might might be a couple, but um, definitely um, it, it, my the biggest struggle has been too much stuff, uh, too much stuff that hasn't been seen. So trying to, you know, I can't I can't put out a thousand page book or something. It's just it's not feasible to do, you know. And it, and it, I don't think it would maintain. But so so narrowing that down is is has become an enormous kind of task. It was easy when it was sort of like, oh, I just have these greatest hits and I could, you know, but when you kind of want to take the, take the story bigger than that, I kind of want to, you know, uh, for example, um, like I was just looking through stack of, I wasn't sure how we were going to do this tonight. So I wasn't sure I was going to have to hold up prints or not, but you know, for example, I was just going through a stack of work prints and I, and I, I, I came up with this uh, combo, this pairing of Danita from L7 backstage 
being kind of goofy with a beer in her hand and Eddie pouring a wine bottle over his head at, at, at Ole. And they're two really disparate moments, but they work really well. Um, side together. by side. Yeah. So, side by side. So, you know, t taking this enormous body of work and trying to come up with, with stuff like that. I want to kind of put some of the humor and insouciance back into it as well. Sure. Uh, the whole thing's gotten a little bit serious and train spottery at times. Um, so, uh, yeah, just kind of, you know, take it back to its roots. And there, there has just been so much tragedy, unfortunately, mm -hmm. with, you know, some of the key players that, uh, you know, kind of need to move beyond that a little bit as well sure sure no i i, I can totally understand that um and what you're saying because yeah no I, it, it, the, the track it is sometimes bringing up things from the past can you know spark different feelings and whatnot um now you got how, me about, how about how about this picture here of uh uh chris cornell playing in front of a plant <laughs> or next to a plant at uh at the ditto tavern you know just is, just just stuff like that. Uh, I've got tons of, and it's that sort of like okay, parsing that down is a really big job. Man, and, I'm also you know, known as a high hit photographer. If you talk to art directors or whatever, you know they'll they'll say, uh, you know, if Charles brought us a proof sheet of 36 images, there's usually at least 24 that we'd love to use. Wow. So, um, damn, that that that's a hell of a compliment right there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, did that well, again? I, I you know I couldn't couldn't waste film. Didn't want to <laughs> mess around. So. Well, now you got me. Now you got me intrigued. So yeah, first of all, let me apologize. So the, the, my, I've been I've been doing these shows now for about th three years. So actually, it'd be th it's three years this month. As a matter of fact, I've been doing uh doing these live streams, and I've learned that if you over prepare for a show. That they just don't go well. Like I like having a natural conversation, just you know, talking to people and having it goes. So um, the only downside to that is usually when I have a guest and I'm like, hey, just show up at this time. We're gonna have a conversation, and I don't overly prepare the guest either. So um, I, I, you know, I should have maybe <laughs> said that a little bit beforehand what we were doing, but I apologize about that. But now I am extremely interested in what else you have um, that you were gonna pull up. I mean, we I have some photos here, but I, I'm very curious what you have. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try. I got a few things here. Uh, again, earlier I was talking about like, like, like cutting off, cutting, you know, cutting, cutting things off. Like here's Mark Arm at Berkeley Square opening for Soundgarden, which is where I took the louder than love photo oh, yeah. and, and just doing weird, you know, again, at the time this couldn't have been used for anything per se, but now it has sort of takes on new meaning. Um, yeah, it's art. Rip, yeah. rip Gene and the the streak of light coming light. out of his knee. Yeah, it's it's art, you know. And then I have other stuff that's maybe not quite so artistic, but is is interesting. Um, for example, here's Kurt uh, after the Beehive show, uh, signing uh, posters for uh, what else here. Uh, oh, here's here's uh, there's the, I think I probably this, probably put this on IG at one point, but uh, here I am with the screaming trees, uh, photographing in a in a in a window. So you got got yourself in the photo. I got myself with my loser shirt on. <laughs> um. Okay, now I'm lost. Again, here's another couplet that I was just just before the show when I was looking through this stuff. Uh, so you've got uh, I'm trying to yeah, Courtney on the one like side. It. Yep, Courtney on the one side and uh, Slater Kinney on the other. Another. And again, they're just sort of it's it's sort of tying in sort of like her her look and and corinne's side eye there <laughs> and so you know and that's the problem is there's just sort of like endless endless combinations you can do like that when you're designing for a book and at a certain point you just have to stop 
Here's uh, Chris Novoselic before Nirvana played at the uh, Beehive oh. record release party. That's and I, I love I love how he looks like he's like his head is literally touching on the, the ceiling. ceiling. You know, he is a tall <laughs> man. Yes, he is tall. Yeah. Oh. Man, uh, yeah, it, it is. It's almost like the idea of like you. So with this, because you're right now, you have a showcase at Easy Street Records in Seattle that started what two weeks? I think it was two, two, three weeks ago. Yeah, correct? it was a couple, couple weeks ago. Um, it's primarily uh, eight by ten uh, vintage, eight by ten darkroom prints. Okay. Um, as well as a few sixteen by twenty darkroom prints. Uh, and. And I people... just felt I felt because we were doing it for record store day, and I just felt like I wanted to uh, I don't know do something in that in that spirit of of uh, and so these are these are these are prints that I you know I personally made in the dark room at the time, and they all have the the cutout. I don't have a uh, really an example here, but they have the cutout negative carrier, you know, frame. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I sort of the the eight by tens I framed with little corners so they they look like and then matted around that so they look like a actual art. Some I left with the photo by Charles Peterson stamp on the front and any handwriting that might be there. You know they're not perfect and I, I love stuff that's not perfect. You know because it it then does become more like an artifact. So yeah, so if you are in Seattle or planning to attend, how long is the uh, the exhibit going to be on for? For a while, yeah, we 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 we're we're ta- we're possibly months, so we're 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 talking about that. We did sell some, and we're kind of give it a little bit, maybe maybe replace those at some point. I don't know. So Matt and I from <laughs> Easy Street are talking about it. Just go go, just keep rolling with it well, until it. it's you know, Matt kind of wants like just yeah, let's replace them. I'm like, well, the idea is to sell them, and not 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 <laughs> like you know. <laughs> Because eventually, eventually they'll all be replaced, and then you got to take them down. So it won't be like you've sold anything, and I'll have mm. you know these fifty frames on my hands. Yeah, mm. but uh, it's a record store, record store mentality. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you are in Seattle or visiting Seattle in the upcoming months, I would definitely make a trip to Easy no, Street Records. Yeah, then there there's some unique. I picked out some kind of unique pieces for it too. It's it's a it's a fun little show. So. Def- definitely. So if you're definitely in the area, I would highly recommend doing that. Uh, let's just go. I'm going to do a quick rundown of these questions. You can answer them how quickly you want to. Um, what was the last concert you went to? Uh, that would have been Fenway. Pearl Jam yeah. at Fenway. Crazy. Um, that is a lo- what was the first band you ever photographed? The Heat. Okay. Did you ever shoot the Tragically Hip? No. And that right there, I believe, answers all the questions. So with that, Charles, once again, it is an absolute honor speaking with you. Um, once again, I, if, you, if you're if you tuning in, definitely follow Charles Peterson on Instagram. He posts a lot of great pictures up there. Um, like he said, he, you know, some things he pulls out, puts up, so you can definitely keep up with them. So check out his work there. Go to E Street Records uh, in Seattle. You can go check out that exhibit up there right now and buy his work. Um, keep supporting Charles, um, who is a national treasure. I'll call it right now. Charles Peterson, the national treasure. So... <laughs> Charles, any any words of wisdom, or can you leave us with some enlightenment uh, before we, we end the show? Well, you know what I, I tell young photographers is is bend your knees. <laughs> you know, get it, it sounds simplistic, but it's really it's like find that different angle, find that different vision. You know, do. Do so, don't just stand there like a like a stone. You gotta like bend your knees. You gotta get loose. Look behind you. You know, don't get stuck with what's in front of you. Figure out what's going on behind you. Uh, yeah. Oh. And uh, just just do it. You know, don't don't wait for somebody to to help you do it. You just gotta go do it. Well, that that's awesome. Um, 
So, Charles, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate all your time tonight. Um, if you're just tuning in or miss any of the show, this show will be in its entirety up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, if you want to listen to this as a podcast or all of our previous episodes, we have all of our shows on our podcast. All you have to do is search The Touring Fan Live wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, or you can go tomorrow uh, or next week on SiriusXM's app and search The Touring Fan Live and listen to all of our previous episodes on the app version of SiriusXM. And then also we have coming up soon we have shore stock up in september where we'll be raising money for the project matters in asbury park before see here now festival um more information will be coming out soon for that um and then also a uke project where john gloom just and showed our first painted ukulele which will be char- auctioning off for charity for the project matters that's giving um lessons and instruments to kids that can't afford it and all the money we're raising is going to the project matter so they can continue that initiative giving kids instruments and lessons and bands that can't afford it the ability to do that um so definitely check that out you can find out more information by going to the touringfanlive.com till next time i am anthony krizowitz that is a super talented national treasure i'm putting it on his business card charles peterson <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. (laughs) Thank you, guys. (laughs) 